Hi, I am Tony Fry. This is the second session, second video of me talking about books. I'm going to be talking about uh, the future of the university. In fact, I'm talking about the fourth incarnation of the university, which won't make much sense until I start to explain it. Really, there were three uh, mostly unrecognised incarnations. The first which is why I'm saying unrecognised, was the ancient university. The university, the academy before the invention of the university. And then there was the medieval university, coming out of the Middle Ages. And then at the, at the, in the Enlightenment, we come to the modern university. So the fourth university is really going to the situation now, the university after the end of the modern university. In fact, we're at the beginning of the end of that university, which might sound strange when there are more universities in the world than ever before, and there are more students than ever before. But there are reasons for this. 20 years ago, uh, an American academic called Bill Reddings wrote a book called the University in Ruins. Essentially what he said was that the university had lost its cultural project, the reason for the university itself. What it initially, this is at its beginning, in the Enlightenment set out to do, was to create a modern university based upon a modern enlightened subject. But an event, a particular event, not just one, but uh, a very significant one that transformed all of that occurred in the Second World War, now known as the Holocaust. That notion really destroyed the, the, the idea of the continued progression of the human being towards a condition that really went the fulfilment of civilization. At the same time, uh, what's happened subsequently to the university having lost its project uh, is a diminishment of the humanities and the rise of the dominance of science as the measure of all within the university, along with uh, the dominance of managerialism and really the arrival of the direction of neoliberal economics. So it's a really complicated story, but we'll leave it really at this point uh, for further explanation a bit later on. But it's the, it's the background against the which the fourth university needs to be really contemplated. Why? Essentially because the form of the modern university cannot address the problems that modernity has created. You know, we have arrived in a condition of crisis where the very future of the planet is now under question. And the model that is now kind of dominating the university, you know, centres on the replication of the economic status quo, which is indivisible from the problems which is creating the crisis. So we need a new kind of university able to be able to deal with the problems that modernity has created. But before saying more about that, uh, I need to go back to the beginning and give more of an explanation of the development of the university which really establishes the conditions that makes the fourth iteration of the university possible. We begin with the ancient university, and I'm just going to take one example, the Temple of Wasat in Egypt. Uh, Wasat was once the capital of Egypt. Uh, it became later known as Thebes and is now known as Luxor. Luxor. It is somewhere in its first incarnation where scholars from all over the region, all over the Middle East 
and beyond came to study. What they studied was a mixture of mythology and what became really known as mathematics and geometry, you know, a basis of a particular kind of reason. And the, the thing that united both mythology and reason was astronomy. Astronomy, in a sense, became the means by which uh, mathematics developed. Now, interestingly, uh, recently late in the history of Wasat, a particular Greek uh, intellectual called Thales of Miletus arrived to study. And what he did was to take what he'd learnt after a considerable period in Egypt back to Greece and he became the first Greek philosopher. So here is a continuation of knowledge that came out of Africa into Egypt and then to Greece as the beginning of a whole tradition which became again, the basis of the dominance of Western philosophy. Uh, around about 300 years after the return of Thales to Greece, Plato founded an academy, a very influential academy. Uh, and that knowledge, the knowledge that was developed in Greece, uh, that was partly filtered through the, the academy, but not exclusively, arrived in both the Arab world and the Byzantine world. And a lot of the works, particularly of Aristotle, became translated. As a result of that, they eventually got translated into Latin and arrived in Western Europe. So a very protracted process, again, over, over several hundred years. So we have this lineage right away from Africa through Egypt to Western Europe. And now along with this tradition, other traditions also took place. You know, just a few examples. Uh, a very early academy uh, it was established in Nanjing in China in 2058. Same country, in Be Beijing, then Peking, uh, the Imperial College was created in the year 300. Uh, in India, in Nalanda, uh, in a city called Bihar, in 427, another university was created, the University of Nalanda, which interestingly was recreated and reopened in 2014. And then in the Middle East, Again, many academies were created. I'm just using one example, al Karim in Fez in Morocco in 859. Now, as far as Western Europe is concerned, the first university, the first medieval Eurocentric university, misclaimed often as the first university in the world, was established in Bologna in 1088. It dominantly taught theology and canon law. Uh, canon law was a set of audiences, ordinances that you know, governed the law of the church. Now at that time, Bologna was becoming a commercial center. And as a result of that, there became a need for jurisprudence. So that kind of basis of jurisprudence uh, was a foundation upon which the rules of commerce were built, but in turn that was predicated upon learning come out of canon law. So as the Renaissance developed, many other universities arrived until uh, the Enlightenment started to displace that knowledge and as that happened um, 
another university came into, into existence, the modern university, founded in Halle in Germany in 1817. And this is what's really important to understand. This progression, the development of the medieval university and the modern university, was based upon the continual appropriation of new knowledge. So what emerged out of Greece, what emerged out of the Medi University, what constituted the modern university was a gradual progression of transformation through appropriation. And the modern university had, beside a kind of a wider uh, curricula, one other fundamental change. It adopted the use of vernacular languages in which to teach and to research. So that was the break with the dominance of Latin. So the modern university can be characterised as the basis of the modern knowledge in the creation of the modern world through the development of science, through the Enlightenment, and through the formation of the modern cultivated subject, who was a subject that functioned within both the global expanding condition of extractivism in relation to colonialism, and in the making of the modern state and the development of civil society, and the commerce and the activity of everyday modern life. So it had an enormous project that was really dominant until the condition of decline. And the condition of decline on the one hand is kind of manifest through the recognition of the destructive power of colonialism and the fall of civilization represented, as I said earlier on, in relation to the Holocaust. So the circle is complete. We've started with the crisis of the university and now we've ended up back in the modern university at the afterlife, in the afterlife, in the decline of it. What's actually happened is that university has become a commodity. Education has simply become a product. The university of the commodity and its consumer subject, the student. They're dominantly to acquire the accreditation to become employed within an activity, a profession. So effectively, the university has become a service provider delivering, delivering functional continuity to the unsustainable status quo and creating a sufficient degree of cognitive capital for its graduates to be employed in the marketplace. It's in fact ruled by two metrics. The first metrics the first metric is student numbers and the income that is generated by fees or grants or from, or from research. Now, obviously, there are independent universities that are simply commercial and there are universities which are supported in part or wholly by the state. But that metric rules both of the situations. Metric number two is around the phenomenon of graduate employability. And, and as an overarching metric, it centers on a range of performance indicators that are empirically reductive and conformist and often ridiculous. For example, learning outcomes. They're, in a sense, viewing what you learn like a sausage coming out of a machine or graduate attributes that treat 
graduated graduates like a breakfast cereal with a series of specified ingredients. The creation of difference, of non-conformity, is an anathema to the institution. As Nietzsche put it, education, the means of ruining the exception for the good of the rule, and higher education, essentially a means of directing taste against the exceptions for the good of the mediocre. As Redding pointed out in 1996, 95 years after the words from Nietzsche, the very rhetoric of excellence has become a hallmark of the late modern university. And the word excellence in that context is an indicator of its absence. So now to the fourth incarnation. One way of thinking about it, the way I'm going to talk about it now, is through the notion of the Umatic University, the fourth incarnation. Recognising that while the modern university was deeply implicated in making the modern world, what it's revealed is its incapacity to deal with its creation. The Umatic University as one way of talking about the fourth incarnation is about situated learning, not just geographically, but as a placement within the problem, a resituated position of learning that uh, is based upon facilitation over teaching. It is about relational rather than disciplinary bounded knowledge and as such requires disciplinary disobedience in the confrontation with disciplinary decadence. Effectively what that means is that the disciplines that enabled the creation of modern knowledge are actually incapable of making the relational connections to deal with what they have created. So disciplines are revealing themselves to be a condition of limitation rather than enablement. They are, on the one hand, revelatory of the specific, but they are incapable of comprehending the relational general. So what is strategic about situated knowledge, what is strategic about the model of a new kind of nomadic education is a counter institutional formation of knowledge that is rather than trying to establish a minor alternative to displace the d dominant model is about creating the conditions of the production of knowledge that get appropriated by it. So the fourth iteration of the university comes about by the third iteration appropriating knowledge from it. So the imperative, and it can't happen quickly, is to create, uh, to create institutions that produce new knowledge without them conceiving themselves as the fourth iteration, as the new university, but as the means by which the existing university appropriates knowledge that transform it in exactly the same process as the modern university came out of the medieval university. Now all of this uh, is dealt with and spelled out in, in a lot more detail in a short book uh, called The Amatic University Design for the Times, uh, which uh, a little bit of detail will be given in a moment. Thank you.